Hi and welcome to the Module 8 video where we will be transitioning from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, which we'll spend a couple of modules on. Today we'll be talking about the early Renaissance in Italy and specifically we'll be looking at monuments from the 14th and 15th century. Some of the major themes we'll talk about today is this idea of the Renaissance as a rebirth. We'll talk about what it's a rebirth of. We'll talk about the rise of humanism. This is something we've talked about before with the ancient Greeks. It's something that emerges again in Renaissance Italy specifically. We'll also see that there are quite a few quickly changing styles. We're going to focus mostly on painting today, but you will see that just how quickly we're talking about decades between changes in styles here instead of centuries or even millennia. We'll also spend a bit of time talking about the Medici family, which was the de facto ruling family of Florence because they impacted the art world pretty significantly. And finally, we'll discuss a couple of artistic monuments that come from the courts of Italy. So just to give you a sense of what Italy looks like at this time, we've looked at Italy a couple of times now. The country that you know as Italy wasn't formed until 1861. It was composed of different areas ruled by different sorts of people. So for example, Venice is a republic, that means it's run by the citizens. Milan is a duchy, so that means there's a duke. You also have republics in Florence and Siena. And then you see this big swath of central Italy that's called the Papal States. And this was the territorial ruling of the Pope. So the Pope had control over these areas. And actually the Pope was quite active in trying to gain more territory in some cases. And as you can see, the south of Italy is called the Kingdom of Naples. And then you have the Kingdom of Sicily. And this changes hands a number of times. So moving on to some of the major ideas for today, in the medieval period we saw some interest in classical antiquity. You should be specifically thinking of the Roman influence at Rem Cathedral. Also those manuscripts we looked at show Mediterranean influence. We saw Charlemagne's evocation of the Roman past in asserting his right to rule. In Italy, this interest in classical antiquity, which is all around them, really takes hold in the 13th and 14th centuries leading to what we now call the Renaissance, which is this very conscious revival of the classical past. So the people living during the Renaissance are looking back to writings of antiquity, ancient Greek and Roman philosophers and historians. They're looking at the monuments and trying to understand them. They're changing from this very God-centered society of the Middle Ages to this humanistic approach where man is the measure of all things. So of course they're still very religious. That's absolutely true. We'll be looking at lots of religious art. But they saw and measured things based on the human mind, the human idea, and the human body, very much like the Greeks and the Romans did. In many ways, Italian painting over the Middle Ages was influenced by Byzantine painting. The fall of Constantinople in 1204 led to a migration of Byzantine artists to Italy. So before the monuments we'll start talking about in just a moment, you see a lot of Byzantine influence, gold backgrounds, very frontal figures. And then during the Renaissance, we see the emergence of a strong interest in naturalism. So the first monument we'll be talking about today, I'm showing you here. This is by an artist named Giotto. And this is the Arena Chapel, sometimes called the Cappella Scrovegni, the Scrovegni Chapel. And it's in the city of Padua. It's all frescoed, and it dates to about 1305. Giotto is a very, very important name for art history. Part of that is because of this art writer named Vasari, who was a Florentine man who lived in the 16th century. He was a painter and an architect. He decided to write a book of biographies of artists, and he began it with Giotto. And he said that Giotto basically brought Italian art, Italian painting, out of the Greek Dark Ages. He actually refers to it as the Greek period. Think of the Byzantine influence there. He was a student of an artist named Cimabue, and he's usually considered the first artist of the Renaissance, but again, this is very much influenced by this man named Vasari. Giotto was very interested in naturalism and a direct observation from nature, which was not really the priority of the medieval period. Think back to the sculpture we saw, for example, in the Gothic, they begin to become more naturalistic towards the end, but that's more stylized and more emphasis on relating a story. Think back to the Romanesque with the attenuated figures, the sort of zigzag forms of the body and these really strong expressions. So this interest in nature is both in the observation of the figures and also in landscape settings, which we can see in the paintings in this chapel. 
Sometimes people will call Giotto also a late Gothic painter, but he's this really transitional figure. So this chapel, it's a freestanding independent chapel, was done for a man named Enrico Scrivegni. It was his new family chapel, and it's referred to as the Arena Chapel because of the nearby ancient Roman amphitheater, whose remains are still visible in Padua today. So Padua is about a 30-minute train ride outside of Venice. It was an ancient Roman city, and it's the center of the second oldest university in Italy. So, for example, Galileo even taught at the University of Padua. Scrovegni was from a leading banking family. His father, Reginaldo, was renowned for usury, which is this, which was the idea of collecting interest on loaned money, which is a very common practice today, but was considered a, a heavy sin back then. For example, Reginaldo Scrovegni was included in the seventh circle of hell by Dante. That's how well he known he was for banking. So his son Enrico wanted to atone for these sins. And one of the most popular ways to atone for your sins, to bring glory to God, was to commission art and to decorate a chapel. He decided to build this freestanding chapel, and he dedicated it to the Virgin of Charity. So sometimes you might also see this called Santa Maria de la Querita, which is St. Mary of Charity. What we're seeing here is a painting cycle showing 38 scenes from the life of the Virgin, which is on the top level here. And then we have scenes from the life of Christ, which makes up the bottom level of the painting. Below, we have this fictive marble dado. Remember, we talked about this lower level, the dado with Saint-Chapelle. You can see the fictive marble panels here. And you can see these statues here that represent vices and virtues. So this is done in a technique called grisaille, which basically just means grayscale. So it's painting made to look like sculpture. The naturalism that we see in the figures, and I'll show you some details in just a minute, is furthered by Giotto's efforts to unify the chapel. He uses a system of two-point perspective to organize the space, and he uses this very consistently throughout the chapel so that there's a distinctive viewing point for each of the images and a perfect place to stand in the chapel here. Here I'm showing you a detail of the scene of the Last Judgment. I'll show you a larger view of that in just a moment. What we see here is kneeling in the very center is Enrico Scrovegni, and two of these three saints, which are actually supposed to be all different aspects of Mary. So one of them, for example, is Mary of Charity. Remember, that's who it's dedicated to. He's presenting this little model of his chapel to the Virgin Mary. So this is a very direct way of showing how he's atoning for sins by offering this chapel to the saints so that maybe Mary will intercess on his or his father's behalf. So I want to focus on just a couple of scenes. Here I'm showing you the one called The Kiss of Judas. This is a scene of a lot of action in the Passion story. The Passion is the story of Christ's crucifixion. So what we're seeing is in the very center, two figures. On the left with the golden halo, you see Christ staring directly into the eyes of Judas, the apostle who betrayed him, the one who, who got 30 pieces of silver in exchange for ratting him out to the Romans, essentially. So the signal for the one to be arrested was when Judas kissed him. There's a lot of action going on here. You also see on the left side, St. Peter. Notice he's got a knife in his hand and he's cutting off the ear of one of the people who had come to arrest Christ. In the background, this is kind of hard to see, but in the background we have this group of figures all holding clubs and lances and various other things. They're part of the mob that went to arrest Christ. You're seeing their helmets for the most part, and Giotto decided to paint these helmets in pure silver which oxidizes over time, and so now they're virtually black, even though the paintings have been restored pretty considerably. The narrative scenes in the chapel display Giotto's ability to distill a very complex narrative into a coherent visual experience. So there's a lot going on here, but you can very easily identify the centerpiece and this gesture, this, this sweeping robe, this diagonal that leads up to the face of Christ through the drapery here really indicates exactly where you need to be looking and you've got this very intense expression being exchanged between Judas and Christ. He has this ability to model form with color so he renders these bulky figures as basically pure color masses painting the deepest shadows with the most intense hues, the purest form of these colors. 
and he highlights the shapes by mixing in white with the paint. So especially in this technique called fresco, which I'll explain in some depth in just a minute, they didn't like to add black to the colors to make darker tones. So instead, the really dark portions you see inside the folds of this red robe, for example, or in the blue, that's the purest form of the color. They were fine with adding white, but since it's a watercolor technique, uh, it made more sense to add white than to add black. So this is probably the most famous scene in the chapel. This is called The Lamentation. Here we see Giotto focusing the composition for maximum emotional effect by offsetting the Virgin Mary and the dead Christ right here. You can see the mother embracing her dead son, this intense experience, just like we saw with the kiss of Judas, between their faces, although only one is living here. You have this very strong vertical ridge, this diagonal that leads right down to the central figures. And at the top of that, you have the single barren tree, which was a medieval symbol of death. So it's creating this psychological tension, but is also used for a compositional effect where you see this tree and then your eye follows that down to the central figures here. All of the figures are in mourning, and you can see these very emotional angels flying up above them. The figures are large and bulky, but in the midst of their bulkiness, you get a really good sense of the bodies underneath their clothing. And they're not static, they're actually moving quite a bit, especially this figure of St. John the Evangelist. He's throwing his arm back, his arms back in grief, creating this sort of counter movement. The body doesn't naturally do that, creating both motion and emotion at the same time. And that's echoed by Mary Magdalene's very intense emotions. She sits here and holds the feet of Christ. So all of their expressions convey what the viewer should be feeling at the same time. The distraught faces of all of these figures contrast pretty considerably with the calmness of these two figures. They're probably supposed to be Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, who are both said to be present at the crucifixion. Then what's interesting is we also have these two figures who have their backs to us. We can't see much of them at all. We don't really know what's going on with them. They've never really been used before to create the scene of drama, but it's a way of letting the viewer into the space. It's almost like they're just like us, but notice they leave this nice opening for the most intense action where we can just immediately approach it. So instead of creating some sort of symbolic sorrow, Giotto is trying to convey real human suffering, drawing the viewer into the circle of personal grief. Now, I want to point out also, do you see all these lines throughout the sky especially? You can see these, the way the paint changes colors on either side of these lines. This is something I want you to remember while I explain fresco technique. So here I'm showing you a diagram uh, explaining how fresco technique works. This is a wall painting, and it is something that is very, very durable because it actually becomes part of the wall. The first thing you do if you are making a fresco, you have this wall that is existing. You lay down a layer of very rough plaster called the arricho, which is indicated here. Then you make a drawing on top of it in red ochre called the sinopia, uh, which is how you know what to paint and where. After that, you add a layer of smooth, fresh plaster, which is called the intonaco. You could only apply the intonaco one patch at a time, Hence why I pointed out in the lamentation the distinctions between those different patches of the sky. That's because those are laid down for enough painting for one day, which is referred to as a giornata, which is the Italian word for day. So you could only lay down one day's work, because if you laid down too much fresh plaster, then you'd have a really uneven layer of the wall. So after you lay down this giornata, this intonaca layer, enough for one day's worth of work, you add a water-based paint onto the surface. So you grind up pigment, mix it with water, and then you put that on the damp in Tonaco, like we're seeing with the color here in this diagram. Then after that, if you wanted, you could add details in paint on the dry wall, and this is referred to as a secco. The technique I just described is called buon fresco, good fresco. If you add details on top of the dry wall later, it's referred to as fresco a secco, fresco done dry. So for example, in this scene we see here, you can see the giornate, the individual days of work, and then see the gold. This gold leaf is one example of what might be put on a secco, what might be added to the wall. It's much less durable if it's added on top of the drywall, whereas the paint laid directly on this fresh plaster becomes a part of the wall. So frescoes are very durable as long as the conditions of the space stay 
fairly intact. So for example, you don't get a lot of fresco in Venice because Venice is very damp and that is a good way of ruining your fresco. I just wanted to point out this comparison very briefly just to give you a sense of how much has changed from the Byzantine period. Of course, we've got centuries separating this. So remember, uh, the Justinian mosaic is from the 6th century versus the 14th century, so a lot of time in between. But in the Byzantine world, we get a lot of frontality, this emphasis on the sort of still image of the emperor and this golden background. Whereas with Giotto in the Arena Chapel, you've got this intense drama. This comparison, I think, makes Kiss of Judas look even more intense. There's a recreation of naturalistic space, even if we've lost that a little bit over time with the darkening of these silver helmets. So we, we understand that they're receding into space, that Giotto is stacking them in this way uh, so to indicate that they go deep into the background. But look at the intensity trying to tell a story. Of course, the Justinian mosaic is not trying to tell a story. It's representing this idea. But still, Giotto is interested in creating an emotional response from the viewer. I finally just wanted to point out this back wall on the entrance wall of the church opposite the altar, the complete opposite end. Giotto painted a last judgment, which looks quite different than the last judgments we saw before. And remember, I showed you this little detail before of Enrico Scrivegni presenting a model of the chapel to the Virgin Mary. So it's very nicely organized last judgment. You see the angels all flying up in heaven. Christ in the mandorla, like we saw in the Romanesque period and the Gothic period, surrounded by saints. And then on the left, you have these nicely organized saved people. They're at Christ's right hand. And then on the lower right, at Christ's left hand, we see this intense scene of hell. You see this devil who's eating a couple of people here. Actually, this devil is very similar to the devil indicated at the end of Dante's Inferno. And there's some speculation that Dante may have helped Giotto formulate some of the ideas for this chapel, although we can't confirm that. Now I want to talk about a very different style going on at virtually the same time as Giotto. Giotto is from the area around Florence, and central Italian painting in Florence and Rome is interested in this naturalism. Instead, in Siena, where this comes from, we have a very different approach, one that's much more Byzantine. It's a synthesis of Byzantine and Northern Gothic influences. Before I go into a lot of depth about this altarpiece in particular, I want to talk about an alternative technique of painting instead of fresco. Here we have an example of tempera and gold on panel. I see now that I have misspelled tempera in my slide. My apologies for that. Tempera is the preferred medium of painting in Italy for wooden panels. What you have for tempera is pigment mixed with a water and egg mixture, typically egg yolk in particular. It had to be applied with little tiny brushes. It dried very, very quickly and was opaque. So you see how the garments of the figures, the reds here, the blues, there's no luminosity to it. It's very flat. You can't see any layers built up of the paint underneath it. It took a lot of brush strokes to make a painting out of tempera. Then it would be left to dry, and some painting manuals recommended that it be left to dry for up to a year. And then after the time had passed when it finally fully dried, they would then add a layer of varnish. So what I'm showing you here is a, a large-scale altarpiece by an artist named Duccio. It's called the Maesta, which means majesty. It was formerly in the Siena Cathedral, and it dates from 1308 to 1311. If you want to see this in person, you still need to go to Siena, but it's now in the museum of the church instead of on the high altar. This is one part of a larger altarpiece that I'm showing you. So I'm going to show you what the whole altarpiece looks like. Here I'm showing you the entire front, and this actually gives a better representation of its color. So I, we were looking at this central panel, the main body of the altarpiece, but you can actually see that these altarpieces were much much more complex than just a single panel. You have these saints standing here, you have angels and Christ decorating the top, and then you have narrative scenes across the top here and even more down below. Here I'm showing you a very blurry image of the back. That's okay. We're not going to talk in too much depth about it here. Um, this, is, this is completely filled by narrative scenes. So it's this very complex imagery. I want to, to point out before I move on and go back to the central image, I want to point out this panel right here because we'll be looking at that in some detail, but now you know where it is on the altarpiece. 
this central panel of this altar piece is seven by 13 feet. So keep in mind how much work would go into this. If you're painting in temper and painting in little tiny brushstrokes, you're working on an enormous altar piece here. It had to be painted on both sides. The reason it has two sides is because it was for the main altar, which stood in the middle of the sanctuary or the app space. So people could actually walk behind it and see the images there. So the main scene depicts the Virgin and Child in majesty, and it was once accompanied above and below by narrative scenes from the life of the Virgin and the infancy of Christ, which I already showed you. On the back is exclusively scenes from the life and passion of Christ. So this brilliant color palette that you're seeing here and this emphasis on gold is very characteristically Sienese. It's got this sort of linear grace to it. You've got a lot of overlapping figures, but they fit very comfortably in the space that Duccio has created. There's an iconic nature, like an icon, to the central and holiest figures. Here I'm showing you a detail of that just to give you a sense of how iconic they are. It's very frontal figures. If you look at the face of the Virgin. I mean, she's, she's not very naturalistic looking, right? Sienna is still not as interested as the Florentines in creating something to look very naturalistic. She's got these lovely folds of her drapery. Christ is sort of like a little man instead of a baby but it's giving across a certain idea that these are holy figures enthroned, surrounded by angels here for your worship. So here's the scene I wanted to show you in some depth. This is also the scene of the kiss of Judas, just like what we saw in the arena chapel, but here is the Sienese take on it. So Christ is obviously the central figure. He's a little bit larger than everybody else. He has this very distinctive halo surrounded by people who have no halos. Even St. Peter here cutting off the ear of the guy who came to help arrest Christ. Even he doesn't have a halo even though he's a holy figure. You see all of the other apostles running away. They want nothing to do with this. And then there's Judas right here kissing Christ. Again the signal to arrest Christ. There's a bit of a background here, almost more so than what we saw with Giotto, but notice the gold leaf in the background, which really flattens out the space. Giotto's scene conveys a little bit more dynamism and drama, I would say, than Duccio's scene. Even though we've got figures who are in motion running away, they're sort of overlapped in these weird piles. It's not as organic as Duccio's is. It's just the style that the Sienese preferred, this emphasis on gold, the use of tempera creates a very different effect. Interestingly enough, Duccio only had access to nine pigments, and he was still able to create a lot of variation throughout the altarpiece, even with a limited color palette. One other thing I'd like to point out is notice another way that they're emphasizing Christ here, how Duccio's emphasizing Christ. Nobody else is wearing the same color red or blue as he does. This blue is very different than the ones of the other apostles. It's made from a pigment pigment called ultramarine, which was actually more expensive to buy than gold. So that's another way to dem demarcate Christ as the most important figure. And that would be the emphasis here. This is on a smaller scale than Giotto's as well. And so you've got to, just like when we have monumental sculpture, when you have something so tiny, you have to sacrifice some naturalism in order to tell the story as clearly as possible. So now we're going to jump forward about a century when the ideals of Giotto really take hold in central Italy. And that's what a lot of people consider the real start of the Renaissance. Some say Giotto started it, but some say it didn't really take effect for another century, so that's when the Renaissance starts. It's, it's, it's a debate that's never ending. So in the 15th century, there's a lot of Italian intellectual and cultivated circle. In the 15th century, we have a continuation of developments of the 14th century. We see an emphasis on pictorial illusionism, trying to create to, trying to recreate the naturalistic world. We see patronage existing for civic responsibility and for self-promotion. Think of that with the Arena Chapel, for example. We'll see more of that in the 15th century. But always underlying this, we have humanist ideals. You also have a growing status of the artist, which really culminates in the 16th century. At this point, artists are really considered craftsmen. It's not an art. They're more like artisans. Um, they have to belong to guilds. So they're a lower class than other professions. So Florence becomes this really important hotbed for a lot of the developments of the Renaissance. There must have been something in the water. A couple of writers and intellectuals from the 14th century, including Petrarch and Boccaccio, some of the most famous Italian writers, they lived in Florence during their lives. 
They helped to revive classical literature and intellectual pursuits, and they were very interested in the readings of Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, Ovid, and other Roman writers. There was an emphasis on education and expanding one's knowledge, especially of classical antiquity. You also see in the, 15, in the 14th and 15th century this emphasis on the vernacular. Instead of seeing things written in Latin, you start seeing things written in Italian, and especially Italian as we know it today is actually a Tuscan dialect, so different regions have different dialects, but Italian as we know it today starts to come about in the 15th century, and specifically through the writings of somebody like Dante. This makes literature available to a wider audience because not everybody spoke or read Latin, only the most educated people did. With the invention of movable type in 1445 by Johannes Gutenberg, you have this wide distribution of printed books, and books become much cheaper, more people become literate, and there's an emphasis on classical texts. Artists also begin writing about their works in this period. Uh, we have the artist, and the painter and architect, Leon Battista Alberti, and he wrote treatises on painting and architecture. With patronage, patronage is the people who sponsor a building or a painting. This is done by the elite class. You see this at courts, you see wealthy merchants doing this, you see religious authorities, and sometimes the civic authorities commissioning things as well. So keep in mind that Florence is this major center of humanist development in the 15th century. It saw itself essentially as a new Athens and identified itself with classical republics because remember, Athens was a republic for a great period of time. So we actually see lots of public commissions. Something else we see going on in Florence a lot is the idea of competition between artists. Often for a major civic commission, they would have a competition between artists. So artists are going to do their absolute best. It inspires this, it's this Republican ideal that the best artist should prove himself. It also created a lot of rivalries. And as an artist rose in prominence, they had to submit to fewer competition. I wanna talk about one monument of architecture and that here is the dome of the Florence Cathedral by an architect named Filippo Brunelleschi. He is also the person responsible for rediscovering the idea of one point perspective, and that is organizing a pictorial space based on a single vanishing point so that all lines recede to the one point. And it's a way of creating a space to look naturalistic. We'll talk more about that in our next module. He went to Rome probably first in 1402, and he may have made that trip with the sculptor Donatello and it led to an interest in architecture because of the ruins of ancient Rome. He studied these ruins and they added to his later designs. The dome of the Florence Cathedral was a way of Brunelleschi to usurp one of his competitors' newfound prominence. There was a competition for the dome, but no one was sure how to cover the massive space at the crossing of the cathedral. So the dome covers the crossing where the transept meets the nave. Brunelleschi's model won the competition, but they insisted that another artist, his arch rival Ghiberti, had to assist him. At some point, this is one of the fun stories we could get from the Renaissance, Brunelleschi plays sick, he doesn't come into work one day, so that Ghiberti's incompetence at architecture and engineering would be on display, and that's how he got Ghiberti dismissed from the project. So this is a really good example of this rivalry that I was talking about. So the dome is based on the plan of the church. He had to come up with something that didn't need exterior buttressing because the church was already built all the way up to the drum, this layer underneath the dome where you see all of these oculi, oculuses. He had to make it on this octagonal dome, and nobody had been able to cover this much space since the building of Hagia Sophia. What he ended up doing was making a double shell design. And here I'm showing you this cutaway view so you can get a sense of that double shell. You see the exterior here and this interior rib system. What resulted is that the more weight was added, the stronger the dome became. So you see these primary ribs at each corner of this octagon, and then these secondary ribs, all of which bring the weight of the dome right down onto the drum and down onto the existing building. So in the exterior view here, you see these enormous ribs, which are also relieving the weight here. They jut up from the dome all the way up to the space called the lantern. They're sort of like hidden flying buttresses. So he develops a system of arches which are held together by these enormous sandstone rings that he inserted throughout. You can see those as the horizontal elements here. The inner and the outer shells are linked. It becomes the largest dome built since the Pantheon in Rome. Maybe he would have wanted a typical hemispherical dome, but he turned to Gothic techniques, specifically the pointed arch 
to create a stronger and more stable structure. The exterior shell is quite thin. The ribs are big, especially those in the exterior. Normally a huge dome like this requires a dangerous and expensive wooden centering to build it, but he ended up making his own machines to hoist things up, and he developed a self-buttressing design. What's one of my favorite stories about the building of the Florentine Dome is that when before Brunelleschi's development, they were trying to come up with ideas of how on earth they could build to cover this huge span of space. One idea was that they should bring in an enormous dirt pile to build over it, and they would hide in it lots and lots of golden coins so that after the dome was constructed, they could get any of the citizens of Florence to come help them haul away dirt and any coins they found they could keep. They didn't end up having to do that since Brunelleschi was this brilliant engineer who made up his own tools in order to build this enormous dome. This was really a triumph of architecture. It made Brunelleschi extremely famous and he was sought after by all sorts of patrons. He really here is utilizing medieval architectural traditions and turns later to classicizing Renaissance designs. You can see some of those in your textbooks. Now I want to move on to the Medici family and some of their related commissions. There were this prominent banking family that had control over the government, although they weren't officially in power until the later part of the 16th century, until about the middle of the 16th century. But they had enough influence, they had friends in high places, they helped put their friends in high places, that they basically had control of the government. Florence has this love-hate relationship with them. They throw them out for a while, and then they're in crisis, and they need them back, and then they throw them out again. So it's this drama between Florence and the Medici. Regardless of the fact that Florence was a republic in name, they were able to maintain control like princes. And as I said, they eventually become Dukes of Tuscany in the mid-16th century. Now, before I talk about this work of art in particular, I want to mention a couple of symbols that are associated with Florence. As a republic, they see themselves as these strong victors over tyranny. So they're sort of these little guys who are going to triumph over whoever is trying to come in and rule them. So one symbol is Hercules. He first appears on the seal of the city in the 12th century. Another is the figure of David, especially in his youth, this triumphant youth over the clearly evil Philistine Goliath. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. And finally, the figure of Judith, who was a counterpart of David. She was this female who triumphed over an Assyrian gen general named Holofernes and saved her town from utter destruction. This is in one of the apocryphal books of the Bible, so they're often counterparts to one another. What I'm showing you here is the sculpture of David by Donatello. It dates to about 1430 to 40 and is made of bronze. Donatello went to Rome in his youth to study ancient statuary, and the David here is thought to have been commissioned by the Medici. And what it is is the first freestanding life-size nude since antiquity. It's an important fact to remember about this. We see the contrapposto stance. He's the sensuous youth, and we see a new emphasis on the body that would have been rejected in the medieval period. This nude figure would have been completely out of place in the Middle Ages. We see this interest in the individual, on the body of man. This sculpture stood in the courtyard of the Medici Palace, but it may be originally was for a different site. It was in the courtyard, so it actually was visible from the street. The Medici liked commissioning images of youth at this time, and this is a departure from the typical depiction of David, since he's shown both in the nude and so young. How old is he? About 13, maybe? Often you see the David as this very adult figure who's triumphing over Goliath, not this little youth here. But it's interesting that the Medici apply this symbol to themselves, especially since it was this symbol of Florence, showing themselves as victors over tyranny. It's it's got a lot of potential messages it could be sending. Donatello had, before this, made a statue of David for the city, which is now in the city hall of Florence. Here, the Medici are appropriating the civic image for a private citizen, and one who is honestly doing quite a bit of usurping themselves. Following their expulsion from the city in 1495, this sculpture of David was taken to the Palazzo della Signoria, this city hall. It was displayed in that courtyard, and they added an inscription to it, making it the city's, and the inscription named it an exemplum of public well-being. So there's a lot of interesting interpretations of this David. Sometimes it's seen as the figure of Mercury. So for example, this hat that the David is shown wearing, that's really more typical of the god Mercury, who was the messenger god. 
Uh, the messenger god was also known for carrying a decapitated head for a while. So maybe the Medici wanted it to be a double interpretation to avoid that problem of taking on this public image. There's also often a homoerotic interpretation of this piece because you have this lovely nude male figure. He's got the enormous sword of Goliath. The head of Goliath rests at his feet. You can see his helmet here. The helmet of Goliath had wings and this wing reaches up inside the leg of David and his toes here play with Goliath's beard. So there's been lots of art historical interpretation of the figure. It's hard to ascertain how it was intended to be read and it could be read in a number of different ways. So you, when you're thinking about the David, you wanna think about the use of bronze as a classicizing factor, the nude as a classicizing factor, but also how it's very much Renaissance in that it's this major symbol of Florence done for the Medici family. Another work done for the Medici family is this work by Sandro Botticelli called The Birth of Venus. It dates to about 1482, so this would have been a later commission by the Medici as opposed to Donatello's David. So the Medici surrounded themselves with talented artists and intellectuals, and they were major collectors of art, both contemporary art, contemporary to them, but also they had a significant collection of antique sculptures, gemstones, etc. This is very different from what we've seen of other paintings. This is tempera paint on canvas, actually. The image that we see is based on a poem by a Renaissance humanist named Angelo Poliziano. He was also affiliated with the Medici Circle. It's based on an ancient mythological story of the birth of Venus, the goddess of love. She was born out of the sea foam and carried to the island of Cyprus on a shell by Zephyrus, this west wind who we see over here, who is also carrying the goddess Chloris. On the right, we see the nymph Pomona, or sometimes she's interpreted as Flora, who's getting ready to garb Venus as she approaches on this shell. This very lyrical and graceful linear style is a hallmark of Botticelli. So there is some naturalism. There's an interest on the, on the figure here. He probably studied from the live model in order to paint this, but there's, there's a certain linear quality to it. So you could almost feel like there's an outline to the body. The forms are not done by modeling so much as line drawing. And this is actually a characteristic of Florentine art in this period. Another thing we see here, and I hope you're noticing this, that this is the first mythological scene we have seen in quite a long time. This is another thing that happens in the Renaissance, this interest in classical mythology. Venus in the center here is this beautiful idealized nude. She's representing celestial love, not earthly love. And this was part of a, a Neoplatonic philosophy that was widely studied in the Medici circle. So they're interested in other philosophies, kind of religion, but more just a way of living your life in what's called a Platonic way. The Platonic Academy was founded by the Medici in 1469. And the Venus here in the center is based on classical statues in the Medici collection. So there's a, a, an ancient sculpture of Venus, a Roman copy of a Greek original, and she's in this exact pose. And the Medici knew of versions and owned their own versions well in advance of Botticelli painting this image. We don't know exactly the circumstances of the commission here. It's very likely given the scene that it was probably commissioned for a marriage celebration, that this was meant to hang in someone's bedchamber. Often when you see classicizing subjects in the nude, they have something to do with marriage or the bedchamber. And this is something we'll see in our next module as well. So as I mentioned, Botticelli has some interest in naturalism, but notice also that it's really not that naturalistic because look at the figure of Venus. There's aspects of her body that don't make a lot of sense. Look at the position of her feet, the lean of her body. It's really not physically possible for her to be standing with her knees way over here without just toppling over. So you see some interest in creating a realistic looking body, but you still have a lot of aspects of idealization going on and a greater interest in linearity rather than really creating in this naturalistic world. Not to harp too much on Botticelli, but when we look at later examples of painting, you'll almost think that Botticelli looks cartoonish. But this is what was the interest at the time. They were developing these shades of naturalism. So for our last two images of the day, I want to move on to a couple of works of art that were commissioned by the courts of Italy rather than by cities or private 
individuals within these cities. This work by Piera della Francesca is a double portrait of Battista Sforza, that's the woman on the left, and Federico da Montefeltro shown on the right side of this, and this dates sometime after 1475. Here we have a combination of the two major painting techniques of the Renaissance, oil and tempera, and this is done on wooden panel. Federico da Montefeltro was the Duke of Urbino, and this is a city in central Italy in the region called Le Marche. He was a mercenary soldier, so that is a soldier who was hired out by other people, who could be hired by anybody to go fight in a battle. And he established Urbino as the ideal Renaissance court. He was able to strike a perfect balance between military prowess and establishing an erudite image of himself. So there's lots of portraits that survive of him. And one of them shows him in his armor, in his library, reading ancient texts. So he wanted to cultivate this idea of himself as both a Renaissance prince, but also this important warrior, which is how he made his fortune. He took the city of Urbino from his brother in 1444, built an enormous Renaissance palace there, and had Piero della Francesca as his court artist. As a child, he was at the court of Mantua as a hostage, and there he was given a humanist education. So he really developed both of these aspects of himself, this humanist scholar and the soldier from very early on in his life. He began building his court in 1468, and he spent more money on art and architecture than any other Italian ruler. He really wanted to assert the legitimacy of his line to show himself as a virtuous Christian prince, since he was mostly known for killing people. So art was a way to show both his military prowess and himself as a just ruler, because he wanted to be seen as an equal to any other ruler in Italy, the Pope, the Medici, the Duke of Milan, any of these other people. He was also known for his extensive library and a second only to the Vatican Library. He emphasized in his collection military strategy and history, scientific and philosophical writings as well. He wasn't so much interested in beautiful decoration in his books, but in comprehensiveness of his collection. When comparing it to other libraries like the Vatican, that of the Medici, or even Oxford, a contemporary wrote that all of those libraries had defects or doubles except for that of Federico de Montefeltro. So let's talk about this portrait in particular. This double portrait was commissioned just after his wife Battista had died. She never fully recovered from the birth of Guido Baldo, who was Federico's heir. This is shown in what's called a diptych, that is it has two panels that work together, a diptych, and this frame that it's in now is, is a bit later. And there's the possibility that it actually was inserted into a frame originally that was closable like a book so that maybe Federico could take it with him as he traveled so that it was easily foldable and easily portable. The profile view that we see them in recalls commemorative medals or coins from ancient Rome. They're both set against a generic landscape of their realm and this is actually continued on the back side of the panel which I'll show you in just a minute. They're heraldically arranged, that is, in the symmetry. Their collars both stand right at the horizon line, so it's very carefully organized with the background, even though they seem like simple profiles. And they're set against these generic landscapes of their realm, so it sort of resembles the area around Urbino. The landscapes also give a sense of gender roles. Notice that Batista is shown in, in front of a darkened, fortified city. You can see it in the background. But Federico is shown before rolling hills and waters because she stays at home, she stays in the fortified city, and he goes out into the world. You see this river going back into the landscape because he was often traveling because he's this mercenary soldier going all over Italy to fight. Their portraits are in opposition to each other. Battista shows that she was very highly cultured. She's a very fashionable lady of the Renaissance. You see her plucked hairline. You see how high her forehead is, how far back her hairline goes. She has almost no eyebrows. They plucked out all of these, potentially even plucking out their eyelashes at certain times. She's shown in this very nice clothing, the pearls at her neck, whereas Federico is shown as this epitome of dignity in a ruler's costume. Notice he's not shown as a soldier here. One thing to point out about Federico, he has a very distinctive face. See this bridge of his nose is missing? He was actually disfigured in a tournament, and it's very characteristic to see him from the left side because he lost his right eye and the bridge of his nose in this tournament. So he was scarred, 
The artist Piero doesn't completely disguise this. We can see the propaganda value of this image of Federico. To use that injury made him very recognizable. And remember, even the Roman emperors, even earlier examples that we've looked at, really like to have this recognizable image of their ruler. So here I'm showing you the reverse of each panel. So we've now flipped. Federico is on this side. They're each on a chariot. We see him in armor here. And here is Batista on this chariot. And we're seeing them in triumph. You also have the same sort of landscape on the back. They, co they communicate with each other, but again, he's shown in front of all of this watery landscape. The Latin inscriptions that you see indicate Federico's esteem for humanist scholarship, and he's surrounded by personifications of justice, prudence, strength, and temperance. Notice he's also being crowned by a victory like so many other rulers that we have seen. With Batista, we see her shown reading a prayer book. And her inscription is in the past tense because she had just died, and it extols her modesty and her role as a famous man's spouse. One of the major things emphasized here is chastity, with the unicorns drawing her cart. According to legend, only a virgin could approach a unicorn. And chastity is the most important thing that a woman can bring to a marriage in this time period, because the major goal of any marriage in the Renaissance is to produce children, that you know your heir is your heir at this time. So in addition to chastity, we also see her surrounded by personifications of faith and charity and other figures who are not identifiable. So there's this strong interest in looking to classical antiquity and classical mythology, but also con contemporary depictions of other rulers. We see these different aspects that are being emphasized, especially the humanistic aspect of Federico on the front. Now moving on to our last monument, we're moving to the court of Mantua which is in northern Italy. It's not that far away from Venice. It's kind of between Urbino and Venice. And here we're going to be talking about the court of Ludovico Gonzaga. He was the ruler of Mantua, as the Gonzaga family had been since the 14th century. It wasn't a wealthy town, but Ludovico was determined to make it prestigious. He had a salary as a condottiere, this hireable captain, just like Federico. And with his money, just like Federico de Montefeltro, he invested in patronage of the arts to increase his prestige. He hired Andrea Mantegna as a court artist in 1458. And his formal offer to Mantegna, we actually have this on record, was that he would get 15 ducats a month, the provision of rooms where you can live with your family, enough food each year to feed six, and enough firewood for your use. So they were really members of the household and supported as such, these court artists. So Montaigne becomes like a family member, and he spent 46 years in the service of the Gonzaga. Montaigne's style has this sort of sculptural toughness that was also unfamiliar to most court circles. He was very interested in classical antiquity and borrowing classical sculptural types. His works have this very hard three-dimensional quality to them. Here what I'm showing you is called the Camera Picta, the Painted Room, or it's also known as the Camera degli Sposi, the Room of the Spouses, or the Betrothed. This was both Ludovico's bedroom and his audience chamber, and the main intent we have here is to glorify the Gonzaga family. So really there's two walls painted, which I'm showing you here, in addition to these lunettes above, and the entire ceiling is painted, and I'll show you a detail of the ceiling in a minute. The other two walls are covered in fictive gold tapestries, so that is almost certainly the corner where his bed would have been kept because often tapestries surrounded the beds. On the left wall, you can see an inscription carried by these little puti, these little angel figures, and the inscription is dated to 1474, and it says, For the illustrious Ludovico, second Marchese of Mantua, best of princes and most unvanquished in faith, and for his illustrious wife Barbara, incomparable glory of womanhood, his Andrea Mantegna of Padua completed this slight work in the year 1474. So it's interesting how he is uh, making himself less in the eyes of his patron. So the frescoes here don't seem to be depicting any particular event. There have been some suggestions for what it might be, but really it seems to be normal business of court life. So here I'd like to show you this, this detail of this wall where we see Ludovico Gonzaga seated here. He's just received a letter from a courtier who comes in from the left. Seated next to him is his wife Barbara of Brandenburg. Behind them you see their children, courtiers, and attendants. 
Ludovico is in a dressing gown, almost as if he has just gotten out of bed, whereas everybody else here is very formal. So he's holding this letter, which may refer to his son being elevated to a cardinal, which is thought to be what's kind of being shown in this room overall. But maybe it's about his employer. It's hard to tell. There have been a lot of hypotheticals here. But he's listening to the messenger, and you can see that the fireplace is being used here within the painting as the platform. And I love this detail of the steps coming off the top of the fireplace, whereas all of these courtiers in the most fashionable dress, you see their hose in red and white, all of them wearing very fashionable clothing. They're climbing the steps. Montaigne is creating this naturalistic space on the wall using what's already existing in the room to extend that space. We even see it here in the lunette. This ridge above the column capitals into the space the lunette is being used to hang a fictive curtain. It's as if it's been pulled away so that we can see Ludovico and his wife and all around them. Another theory about these portraits is that perhaps this daughter here who's shown in a three-quarter view, you can kind of see her turning towards her maid, she was at about marriage age, and so possibly the visitors to the court would be seeing her portrait as a potential uh, bride for whoever they were representing, whoever these ambassadors visiting Ludovico would be representing. So the frescoes would be used to impress any ambassadors who came to the Mantuan court, even if they saw it when it wasn't quite finished, since it emphasizes the prestige of the Gonzaga and also potentially this idea either of the son being elevated to the cardinalate or the wife being ready for marriage. But then there's something completely different going on in the ceiling. Here I'm showing you a fictive oculus that is a circular window. This is in the very middle of the ceiling of this room, and it's really shaking the gravitas of the room as a whole. Here we see Montaigne sort of playing around with the viewer, and remember the ideal viewer here is Ludovico Gonzaga. He's the one who's going to see this most often of all. So first, he painted this illusionistic ceiling. You can get a hint of it here. And if I go back a slide, you can get a sense of what this looks like, these decorative architectural features. All of this is paint. The paint extends here. This is a flat ceiling. There is no opening here. We see a lot of foreshortening, so this illusionistic virtuosity of Montaigne to show what looks like these little putti, these little angel baby figures, like we're seeing them perfectly from below. So that's called foreshortening, when an artist has to manipulate the way something looks in order to make it look as naturalistic as possible. Everything here is fictive, and it's lit in a similar way to the fake relief sculpture that makes up the rest of the ceiling. The rest of the ceiling is covered in fictive gold mosaic, stucco molding, ribs, and this oculus. It looks as if we're looking into the summer sky. So you see the putti that I mentioned, all these little babies with wings, and also these court ladies here, not to mention this huge peacock standing here, and then this figure of a Moor who's supposed to show sort of the international aspect of the Mantuan court. But you see how they're all looking down at us just like we're looking up at them? Are they whispering about what they're seeing down below? What about these women? Who are they looking at? And look at this huge wash basin filled with leaves perched on this bar that could fall on us at any minute. Then you have all sorts of fun little details about these putti figures who are getting their heads stuck in these spaces. So it's this way for maybe Ludovico to take a moment out of his busy day to look up at this and maybe laugh. It's a sort of joke or game between Andrea Montaigne and his important patron. So it's this witticism between the artist and the viewer, and we see an interest in doing that in the Renaissance, and we'll see more of that in the Baroque period as well. It's something that we don't see in the Middle Ages. With the Renaissance, they're really thinking about their viewer in really explicit ways, connecting the art to the viewer very distinctly. So to wrap up for today and for you to finish Module 8, what we talked about today was this idea of the Renaissance as a rebirth of classicism. We saw this with Donatello, also this rise of humanism with Donatello, this emphasis on how can I make something look almost as if it's antique. Renaissance artists really wanted to compete with classical antiquity, and of course we wouldn't we wouldn't mistake Donatello's David as being an antique sculpture, but he's using the right medium. He's making a life-size freestanding bronze using contrapposto and this perfect naturalism. We also see very quickly changing styles, and you'll especially see that when we talk about the High Renaissance in Module 9, but the transition from Giotto through Duccio to the painters and architects working in Florence, you see 
drastic changes over very short periods of time. We also talked about some major patrons, including the Medici family, these de facto rulers of Florence. We also talked about the patronage of two courts at Urbino and Mantua and the life of these court artists who are painting in order to promote their particular ruler and the ideas that the ruler wanted to promote about themselves. So now to wrap up, you have the self-assessment to take regarding what you've heard in the lecture from the textbook and also from your supplementary reading. On the discussion board, you'll have a prompt related to the status of the artist. There's also an audio post for this module. And finally, the vocabulary wiki needs to be taken care of by group two this week. So thank you for watching, and I will see you for module nine, where we'll talk about the Renaissance in Northern Europe. Thank you.